going on, everybody? I hope everyone's having a good day. Today here, I'm here with my friend Patrick, otherwise known as Dynamo DeFi. And uh, today we're going to be going into a conversation about various crypto DeFi topics, you know, how we got started and some more stuff. Likewise, so, uh, happy to be talking here with John today. We're going to put this video on both of our channels. John is a stellar Twitter crypto user who I came to know through there, also has a YouTube channel. Uh, I am mostly active on YouTube, but also Twitter. Dynamo DeFi is the channel. And today we're just going to talk about how we got into crypto, what we're building, where we see the market going, and wherever else the conversation takes us. Yeah, for sure. So I'll ask you first. So what's kind of your background and how'd you kind of get into crypto to start? Yeah, so long story. And I don't know if I've ever actually shared this fully on video. So my first opportunity to get into crypto was way back in probably 2015 or 2016. I was senior in college studying economics. And a friend of mine, friend of mine was in computer science. And he reached out to me and said, Hey, I know these people who are at a cryptocurrency fund, they're hiring, would you be interested? And I said, No, which was probably the biggest financial mistake I've ever made. Because I didn't know anything about cryptocurrency at the time. I already had a job i was going to go work in the corporate world uh big mistake of course you know bitcoin was probably a few hundred dollars or something at the time uh okay. but come a few years later i was working in supply chain forecasting for a major food company and doing that i sort of came to see how a lot of those systems were highly centralized and i knew somewhere in my head that if you could make a decentralized system that there'd be a lot of benefits to that in terms of resiliency and and many, many other things. So then I came to hear about blockchain technology and cryptocurrency back during that bull run. And, uh, you know, it sort of clicked. I said, okay, this is how you could actually build some of these decentralized ideas I had. Unfortunately, I did not do a good job of trading on that where I, I bought Ethereum before the top, but didn't sell. I held it all the way down. I bought some other coins that never fully recovered. Uh, and basically paid my tuition fees, lost virtually everything I put into the market uh, back then, which was actually most of my savings at the time. Uh, but but I learned my lesson. And unfortunately, I did not continue to invest in I got bored, I, I continued in, you know, until halfway through 2018, got bored, exited the market, which I think is what happened to a lot of people. And then come 2020, I was at home, like many people uh, started to have DeFi pop up on my radar again, being online a lot as I am, and uh, and and, st and started to research it, started to test out some DeFi projects, uh, and then basically, kind of fast forwarding to 2021, I was trying to get my dad into it, and uh, I was trying to teach him how to do some stuff, and I couldn't find videos on how to do it, specifically some things related to transferring funds between different subnets on Avalanche. My first video on my channel was to transfer things from the Avalanche X chain to C chain. And we couldn't find a video and people who are of an older generation don't want to read like Git docs or some sort of technical looking document somewhere. They want a video. So I made a video, recorded it. And then I was like, hey, you know, this is getting a decent number of views. Maybe I should make some more of these. So I just started recording videos at the time I had a, I used an Amazon gift card to buy a $20 microphone. Uh, that's what I was using. It didn't show my face because I didn't have a good webcam. Uh, and we just started recording things and then steadily upgraded the quality over time as it got more views. And then, you know, fast forward to today, I've, I've got a, a decent number of subscribers, about 15,000. I'm working on crypto full time and basically live and breathe it now. And, and I believe as strongly as anyone that DeFi and crypto is the future. That's pretty amazing. That's a pretty amazing story. Yeah, so that was that was the long version, which I don't think I've ever told on, on my channel before. Uh, John, what, how did you get into crypto? What's your story? Well, going back, so when I was a kid, I was diagnosed with a disease called chronic pancreatitis. So I knew I wasn't going to be able to do like the nine to five ever, right? So I was always, you know, researching alternate ways to make income, you know, how to make Google literally how to make money online when I was like really young, like 13 or 14, anything. And I was working, you know, jobs trying to, you know, invest and save and get into the stock market. So, you know, eventually I became like, you know, 15 or 16. And I stayed home from school a lot because I got sick and I would watch just like videos on Bitcoin, you know, 
Ethereum and all these like different coins. And I just started learning about it and I thought it was cool, but like, I didn't like, I didn't like want to know to invest in it. I thought it was interesting, like the technology aspect of it. And I thought like stocks were like a much better option. And I didn't hear about anybody where I'm from. Nobody like made it in cryptocurrency or like, you know, did it big in cryptocurrency. So I didn't really know it was like the best investing thing. So eventually, you know, started getting more, you know, interested in that. And I tried stock trading. So I was like about 17 years old and I tried stock trading with the money that I had saved up from odd jobs and I blew it. Like <laughs> did not do really good at all at stock trading. So I was like, hmm, I'm going to, you know, if you're good at something, you're good at something. If you're not good at something, you're not good at something. Right. So I was like, okay, I'm on to the next thing. Then I tried, you know, e-commerce, like the Amazon stores and different setups like that, but also didn't work out really good. And eventually you know, I downloaded Coinbase. I think Coinbase was the first exchange that I used. And I started investing in altcoins, like, I, like very early. Like, I remember, like, like Kyber Network, Tezos, when they were really, like, Chainlink under $4. Like, these were, like, really cheap prices right before uh, the, it was right before, right after the, or right before the last Bitcoin halving. So, and I had researched, you know, Bitcoin halving. And I was like, yo, the price is definitely going to go up. It happens every halving. Like it's mathematically that. So I was like, okay, I'm going to take a concentrated bet and I'm kind of a riskier person. So I put all my money, like a few thousand dollars into Bitcoin and Ethereum at like $80, you know, really cheap prices. So for me, that was like, you know, my entire net worth. And I eventually started really going up like Ethereum, went to 4,800 and Bitcoin went, you know, 69 K it was like mind blowing, but on the entire way up, I started trading, you know, different coins and I was like putting money in, but I was getting, I was like getting like 10 X returns and I was just blowing my mind. And I said, how is this like even possible? So then that's when I just started my full life became crypto researching every day, like day in day out. And then I started then I found out about DeFi. So DeFi is like my main, where I mainly, you know, I guess full-time DeFi, or I don't know what the term even is, right? So it's like, I got into DeFi really, really, really like early. And I started researching the protocols and like, I started getting, I'm in college. And then I got to college. Uh, I should have entered that too. So I got to college. Uh, I'm a senior in college now. This is like a sophomore, junior. I started, you know, really getting into DeFi. And I was like making good returns. And I was like, yeah, well, I knew I have a business management background, not financial background. So I needed to study all that stuff. So I just spent every single day just studying like COVID happened. And I just spent every day researching, studying like how to trade, you know, financial, what financial terms mean, just getting a basic understanding of how to what's what's affecting crypto. Like, how is it going down? I, I recognize patterns, you know, how to, you know trade every crypto has patterns you just have to identify it it's it's kind of like a game like you, you guys all have your own methods i'm sure so it's just like you you find your own way but i started like really getting involved more in DeFi, and uh then i started getting yield off my profits that i had taken right and you know after that it was crazy i was putting it into stable coins and different products and i had i probably 25x my net worth from like a thousand dollars which was you know, for me at the time, that was the uh, winning the lottery, right? So I had never had more than $10,000. So it was like crazy. So, you know, then I start really, I was like, hey, I think I could actually do this like full time. So then I made the, I made the choice to just, you know, quit my like odd jobs and go completely full time and just talk about crypto, like same kind of as you, like, people were like my dad had I tried to show my dad and he had no idea what to do or how to do it I was like oh well, here's how you could do it and he's like well why don't you show people how to do it and all my friends they didn't want to hear about cryptocurrency so they were like why don't you just you know talk about it so then I made crypto twitter you know I started tweeting about my journey got inspired from like the other big crypto twitter guys you know like Gainsy, Trader Z, all those guys um that and a lot of the younger guys on there that I saw were making it in crypto I thought that was amazing and I was like you know anybody could do this like I was like it doesn't it doesn't have to be discriminatory so I I just literally fully breathed it 24 7 and then you know I get to we get to a few months ago the, the big taking point off for me in my crypto journey was like strong block season like from strong block to like February's when I did like the best there was a thing called nodes I don't know if you 
nodes quotation mark um for you guys that don't know it's just like it's kind of like a a great ponzi like i don't really know how else to explain it like it was like you get in i got in early in a really great project and i was able to use that those funds to rotate into other projects and dollar cost average into other cryptocurrencies that i had researched and eventually i was able to just you know take it full time because i was making more than like real estate at the time like even one rental property off this one project so with that i was like got really getting into investing and researching how to be a proper investor reading books reading all from all the greats and taking like you know notes and making my own philosophy about it so doing all that led me to do dollar cost averaging and other projects and really high yield that's when DeFi, really degen DeFi stuff was coming out you know ohm ohm forks i lost a lot of money in ohm forks but i also did okay on the ohm forks so like those DeFi projects really they kind of really inspired me to keep going hard and eventually it's like you know eventually i really hit it big and i really understood how these node forks kind of worked and that's kind of where i found my niche i guess you could say on you know finding these getting in early to these projects and hitting 100 to 200 x 200 x's and it was like really insane to me because you can't do that in stock well you can do it in stocks but you're not really going to do it in stocks so that was just kind of mind-blowing to me and it kind of you know changed my life and then i was that's when i became like i guess full-time a DeFi dj but really what it led me to was my calling which is my business i'm gonna have to enter a shill here guys llc crypto is it's a legal framework for you to pay your crypto taxes by turning your crypto portfolio into a business so you could have your holdings under your uh, LLC now and be entitled to write-offs, tax benefits, and more legal protections than you would not having that. And like that was able to save users in StrongBlock and other projects thousands of dollars because, you know, node creation alone, it was like five grand. So anybody with an LLC, right, if they put their node under an LLC, they could save that and write it off on their capital gain. You know, I'm in school. I was in school trading and building the business all at once, and it was like kind of crazy but it kind of paid off in the long run because now you know I, I never wanted to work the nine to five but I found kind of my calling in crypto because I was able to become a trader and then create my own business which actually helps you know retail traders uh people that want to create a business or anything and we've been doing okay in beta so it's like kind of like uh, I guess you could say my life purpose so I'm grateful for crypto and that's kind of how I got into it and plan on you know continuing to grow but like for anybody that is listening to this like like you can literally have nothing and turn yourself into a content creator you know influencer whatever you want to be as long as you put your mind to it like take it from my story where you really don't need anything to just you just have to use your mind put in the work and you can really see the results so that's 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 what I kind of got into my story awesome inspirational words uh, that was cool to hear that I no, I knew a bit of your story already, but I didn't know all the details. So right now you're working on LLC crypto and you're still investing in DeFi projects. Are you in the market yeah, right now? Yeah, absolutely. And all of that guys, like all, even, uh, yeah, making free DeFi content guys. Uh, I have a discord. Uh, well, I have a free, uh, discord called the free passive income and research group, which is currently being uh, revamped too. So, uh, and I have, and being, on Twitter and making free content has led me to get other roles in DAOs. So I have two real jobs uh, based off just crypto and tweeting in general that was able to lead me to more opportunities. So that's like another thing I want to add is that if you're somebody that just, just put yourself out there and you cannot even believe the opportunities that will come to you and it's random. Like it's really amazing the space and what opportunities you can do. But no yeah, I'm but but yeah, um, to answer your question, yeah, I'm I'm currently working on LLC crypto right now, uh, revamping the Discord and trading DeFi. You know, still every day, uh, although it's not as what it used to be. Yeah, definitely not. Although there's been some cool things happening recently. Uh, I'm curious, actually, you mentioned uh, that you had a few jobs that came to you in DAOs roles roles via your work. How did that come about? Because I'm sure a lot of people who might be small time content creators on their own are hearing this and they're intrigued well to give you guys the actual full story that nobody's heard before so shout out to my friend i'm going to take it all back here to about two months ago shout out to my friend 
uh, Johnny Garcia. He's the CEO of Health Bank Dow. He took a chance on me. He met me through my tweets. He he liked my content. And he took a chance on me, and he invited me to be a part of his organization, Health Bank Dow. And that and doing that, we had an opportunity. I'm from New Jersey, and we had an opportunity in Los Angeles. So he was nice enough to take some of the team members out to California during that time and be at the LA Fitness Expo and really, you know, I was able to put myself out there and whatnot. So my goal was to sell, you know, LLCs or network with people. I was able to meet that one person, like just somebody walking by. I gave them a flyer for LLC Crypto and I talked to them about it and I told them my idea and they took a chance on me too. And they took my information down and they wrote my stuff down. And that woman, I didn't know how powerful or what this woman would be, right? So I was just kind of excited, right? So fast forward time, I go back to New Jersey and um, she starts inviting me because I talk about crypto and I kind of know what I'm talking about. I'm not trying to sound arrogant. She kind of, you know, she took a chance on me and put me in these opportunities. So that gave me, she let me speak at an event on behalf of her for another DAO with all these really important people. So she just kind of took a chance on me, this random woman. And I was able to prove myself during that. And after I proved myself in that, that led me to more roles where I was able to, she inv- I was able to do a speaking event after NFT New York at a Web3 party. I was able to do two of those because of this opportunity. And that led me, proving myself again, led me to more roles where now I'm in uh, ha- uh, one of the advisors for uh, a medical metaverse DAO on Polygon, which is really cool. It's in the healthcare field, but like that that opportunity led me to that, just putting myself out there and just that, just putting in the work and doing everything, not questioning anything, not doubting anything, and just kind of believing in myself and not not questioning anything kind of led me to getting those roles because they wouldn't have come if you just didn't, if I didn't put myself out there or otherwise. Awesome. That is really cool to hear and just how one thing led to another. I'm personally trying to do some more things like that myself. Now I I have not yet found a way to sort of be fully professional in the space, although I am, I am advising a few projects. Uh, It's interesting to hear about, you know, meeting the people in person and and everything. I think, I think there's probably a lot of wisdom there that, that people can take. Uh, Yeah. So like one thing I will say for like you or anybody listening is like, you have to take the opportunity to just shoot your shot and network with people or just even go to a crypto events because you don't know who's going to be there. Like, like for example, if there's one near your house, why not go? You never know who you can meet. You can meet really interesting and powerful people like, or not, it doesn't even have, or people that could help you out. Right. Like going to, going to events, putting yourself out there and just networking with people and asking around, don't be afraid to ask. Right. Don't be afraid to ask questions or hard questions. People people like that. And founders will take notice of that and stuff. And, you know, there's the problem with DeFi is it's the Wild West. And there's not a lot of people that are professional. So if you're a professional person, you know, it's okay to act professional. You don't have to be in a non. And there's the business and institutions are already coming into crypto. There's no need to be, you know ashamed of being a suit or like going out to events or networking or being friendly that's what crypto is all about and web3 everybody at web3 events friendliest people i've ever met in my entire life like even in brooklyn right it's where people are notorious for being not so nice it's like really genuinely nice people in the space and networking with them and reaching out like you know if you're somebody that's smaller reach out to other influencers, reach out to people that are small, make a DJ and alpha group. That's, that's what I used to do. And I've met so many friends doing that. And like, as I grew my Twitter, like meeting people and talking to people, just kind of how we are too, and connecting with them has, that leads to more opportunities and people will respect you and they'll understand like who you are as a person, if like you have good intentions or whatnot. So it's like doing those steps, those little things actually matter. Like, even if it sounds dumb, hey, say hi to this random, why would I say hi to this random person on the internet? You don't know what can happen. One of the biggest, biggest changes in my life came from me randomly messaging somebody and that helped my business to grow. Like I was stuck on my business and I messaged a guy and he helped me out of his niceness and we became real good friends off that. So that's just like one example or meeting community members. So that's kind of like something I have to say about that great advice. I, I can say as well that I there's people who 
have helped boost me and help me gain followers that I was able to connect with just because I cold DM'd and said, Hey, I, I like what you're doing. Uh, if you want free help, I can help you out in some way. Uh, and that led to a lot of things. Uh, speaking of being in person, uh, I fun fact, I do own the domain names ETH Philly and ETH Philadelphia. So maybe, maybe I'll organize a conference here at some point. <laughs> I have to find a shtick to get people to come, come down to this city though. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Maybe, maybe Atlantic city would be a bit better if we want to stick in the mid Atlantic. Hey, yo, right. But, um, yeah, so I, so like how, what's one, one, what's one piece of advice you'd have for somebody that wants to be a content creator, uh, just full-time, you know, maybe somebody that's in DeFi, they, they're just like us, they do DeFi full-time, maybe, maybe they want to put themselves out there and meet more people. What would you give their, what would advice would you give them? My first piece of advice would be to just start. When I was first thinking about creating my channel, I agonized for so long around you know, should I say this or that? What should I name the channel? Uh, and, and there's things I would do differently in retrospect. And I changed the quality of my videos a lot over time. But the fact of the matter is when you first start, not many people are going to be reading your content or watching your content anyways. So it's not worth agonizing over. It's better just get started. And then, you know, like, like an ounce of practice is worth a pound of preparation. So once you actually start practicing, you'll see, okay, these sorts of videos do better or this thing that I thought would sound good didn't actually sound as good when I listened back. And, and, and you'll naturally get better much, much faster. The other thing I'll say is, and this sort of took me a while to realize myself, is that you'll, you're never going to be the best version of someone else, but you can be the best version of yourself. So if you try to be a copy of someone else, then that can take you a while. But ultimately, the way that you really blow up is by being bringing something unique to the space and being the best version of your own take on things you know i think that's some really solid advice because like even you know no that's some really solid advice for any content creator because a, a lot of people i think a lot of people that want to do that like some you know i have younger guys that are around my age they ask me hey john i want to i want to become an influencer what's the same thing it's like you just have to be yourself the hardest part is putting yourself out there like i'm sure you go through that too like it's hard sometimes, you know, putting yourself out there. And, you know, if you, if you say something and it doesn't agree with people, you know, it could stir the pot a little bit or anything, but like, that's what you got to do is like, you have to put your ideas out there and really like, have, you know, have conviction in what you say or what you do and make, you know, have a, have, you know, what else I like to say to somebody that's up and coming, have a use case, make sure that you're needed because there's a, there could be like a, I don't know how many influencers, probably like a thousand plus crypto influencers what what would separate you from them what makes you have a different use case right absolutely but, um, absolutely and being authentic is extremely important because people will be able to tell if you're not authentic uh, cool yeah. so i want to make sure we talk about some DeFi things as far as yeah. where we see the space going we sourced some questions on twitter before this uh, shout out to don sylvester a user who asked a bunch of questions uh, and, and a lot of these are, are really really good so one question I have for you, I think this is really interesting, is what were the biggest mistakes you made as an intermediate DeFi user or investor? Because people always talk about being a beginner, but what about as an intermediate user? Yeah, so managing risk and you need to play the game. So like managing risk. So for example, I would say the biggest mistake that I've made in projects is is if you have a strategy, every def if you're in DeFi, you need to have a strategy for every single thing you do and stick to it with conviction. Every time that I've gone off and tried to make a DJ and play by myself, I've screwed myself over. Or, you know, or if you, that's kind of like the thing is like not sticking to your plan. That's kind of like the biggest your plan and really have conviction in that. And you have to understand the, the crypto Twitter discord influence, like shilling game because most of the time if you're hearing about something you're too late and that's a lot of people don't do they try they they have trouble getting into projects early it's like you know you need to find your own tools to like do your own research so if you like like not doing your own research could be the biggest mistake that I've made sometimes and listening to my friends because I have confidence in my friends instead of DYORing and you know getting in early to a project I always tell all my followers, best thing you can do, DeFi, DeFi pre-sale, uh, you know, uh, liquidity providing. And um, basically that is like the two things that 
make you the best like 100x chance but if it's not that you need to be in early if it's like under 5 million market cap or else it's it's kind of too late and sometimes sometimes in my experiences so what about you patrick what would you what's like something that um you would say is your biggest like mistake as a DeFi intermediate investor yeah so i would say the biggest thing as an intermediate user was as a beginner i did not make much money because I would buy things after they'd already pumped or when I heard someone shilling it before I sort of learned how to do my own research. The challenge I had as an intermediate user was I had an easier time predicting when things would go up than accurately deciding when to take profits on them. So for example, uh, pancake swap back last spring, so 2021, uh, I got in, I think not as early as many people, but four or $5 went up over $40. I think I sold sold sometimes when it was crashed back down to like fifteen or sixteen dollars, um, be, because because my my plan for what the valuation was going to go to was just totally unrealistic. I was like, okay, I'm I'm going to hold till it's equal to Uniswap, which in retrospect doesn't make any sense. Uh, so I, I did not didn't make the same mistake when it came to the Avalanche ecosystem last year. Sort of learned my lesson there. We're saying, okay, you need to temper your valuations and some of these alternate chains to to what what sort of money might realistically flow into the chain uh, another mistake that i made as an intermediate user was as i got more into fundamental analysis i started to say okay you should look at the teams which is good that's accurate but the mistake i made was i looked for the wrong thing sometimes so i i admittedly became attracted to some projects that may have had the loudest founders but not necessarily the most talented founders who are heads down building. And so, uh, you know, I can think of people can probably think of a few off the top of their heads. Like I, I was into some of the frog nation type projects like uh, Abracadabra, Popsicle Finance, Wonderland, et cetera. And, and, and I, and I took a bath on those. I, I lost quite a bit of money because, because I was like, okay, you know, I want to invest in the good team, but, but a lot of the best founders in this space, are focused laser focused on building and aren't necessarily the same ones that are out in the media all the time. And so I would say learning those things has helped me perform better. And actually some of my best gains came in the spring of this year. So when we were pretty far past the, the sort of peak of the bull run, a lot of my best gains came in that period. Yeah, that's some pretty, that's some pretty good, um, lessons to learn and like actually the thing about the founders i i definitely can agree with you on that i had to teach myself that because you know that's right some of the founders are the loudest or they have a cult and it turns out to be really bad like we've seen that happen a lot of times in crypto now you know danny sifu like suzu kyle davies like three hours capital like there's so many cult personalities in crypto that it's like you need to find the real builders and like something that I've seen, like, yeah, most of the devs that are like that I've heard from other people are super talented are the ones that are just head down laser focus and mostly on like discord and just, you know, taking care of the community like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. By the way, great alpha for people. You can get a lot of alpha in following some of these good founders on Twitter. There's people I know, or I found their accounts and they're starting projects and they're running projects that might have valuations in the tens or hundreds of millions. And they've got like 300 followers on Twitter and they're posting things every day about what they're working on, where they see the space moving, but they're not focused on being influencers because they're focused on being builders. And, and so, so they don't have many followers, but, but you can get in there and you can actually get a lot of good alpha on their projects that way. Oh yeah. Yeah. And that's like another thing. It's like, I see like a lot of influencers, like don't follow a lot of people. Like I, I follow like a lot of like small accounts because they have a lot of alpha. Like I remember one of the most inspiring things ever to me when I was, um, it must've been before the summer before COVID. And I, I saw like an account with like 12 followers, but he had like $13 million in his KuCoin account trading futures. And I, you know, making a hundred thousand dollars to trade. And I was just thinking, I'm like, wow like that is the alpha that i need and like stuff like that and that's i took notes off that stuff you know what i mean so i yeah totally yeah and another strategy i like to use and i've posted about this before is if you see a project that's pumping especially when the market's not doing great you can actually search back on twitter you can only do this on twitter desktop but use the advanced search to see who was posting about it before it was pumping usually it's not that many people 
and say, okay, so those are people who accurately predicted this. What else are they talking about? And that's not going to be perfect because people can get lucky, but that's, that's a way that you can find people who actually have a verified track record of finding things early. And, and again, a lot of these people probably are not, are not as big as you think because growing on Twitter or YouTube is not the same skill as necessarily trading. And I'm not saying that you and I don't have uh, skills in, in DeFi strategies or picking coins early, but, but I'll admit there's people who are, have way smaller presences than me that are better at it than I am. Uh, and it's just because, because that's all they do, right? There's only so many hours in a day. I'm focused on educating people about what I do. Well said. And so what's your favorite, like, what's your favorite thing to do in DeFi? Like you like, you know, taking loans, you like yield farming, do you like, you know, more degen strats, more less degen strats or just, yeah. Uh, for me, it's, it, I would say it's yield farming. I've probably only taken a loan in DeFi once or twice. Uh, honestly, I've, I've looked at a lot of the protocols. I've gone through everything, but actually borrowing, uh, for me, it's mostly providing liquidity and yield farming. And uh, specifically, I like to do it on what I consider to be growth assets. Uh, I don't like to yield farm on stable coins. Uh, and that's something I've gotten flack for in the past, although I've more people understand it since Anchor collapsed. Uh, rationale for me is that for me, my stable coins are like the savings account and I'm not willing to risk losing my savings account for 20% yield. And if it's money that I'm just sitting on the sidelines to go back into the market, I guess that's a different situation. But uh, if I'm going to put it back in the market in a month anyways, then earning 1% on it in the meantime, to me, just is not worth the risk of losing everything. So what I, what I like to do is I'll find coins that I am bullish on anyways, find opportunities to earn yield on that. And then I'll invest that yield into whatever I consider to be the high risk growth assets that I want to hold in the future. Uh, one mistake a lot of people make is they say, you know, I'm earning yield in X token. Uh, I need to hold X token and figure out how to earn yield on it. You actually don't. You can sell that token and you should, the rational thing to do is to take the yield and then put it into whatever token you want to be holding. And maybe it's that token that you're earning yield in, but maybe it's some other token that is on a different chain, right? One thing that I've been doing recently is I'm yield farming on optimism right now, layer two, and I'm taking the profits and I'm saying, okay, I'm going to use those profits to build a position over on the Metis layer two. And then I'll have a position on that layer two eventually that's entirely been built with yield farming. Uh, earlier this year, for example, or I guess it was really from November through January, I was putting all of my yield farming yield from the Cosmos ecosystem into buying Juno, which was a layer one that has had some things happen that I'm no longer invested in. But, but, but at the time it was under $10. Uh, so I was putting all my yield in it and then it ended up running up to $40 and becoming my biggest position after I'd been pouring all my yield into it for a few months. And, and I was just like, how cool is that? That this position that became one of my largest positions was actually built entirely from yield without ever sacrificing my principal. So that's how I like to use DeFi usually. And, you know, sort of using the quote, safer growth risk assets, nothing in crypto is safe. And then pouring that into even riskier things. To me, it's, it's, it's about making these crazy returns. I'm, I'm not, I'm not doing it to uh, make incremental returns in my portfolio. I think that's a pretty good strategy. I, I like that. And I, I, I really like that story about Juno. You know, I'm actually still not completely bearish on Juno. I know there's been some hacks and some stuff, but I still think the tech is really cool with the NFT. Yeah, yeah, I think Juno might might come back. Um, I, I guess the, the thing was I, I was up a lot anyways, and they had this scandal with some yeah. a lot of division in the community. And I said, okay, you know, uh, this was a win in a bear market. So I'm I'm going to take my profit. Uh, and, and, and then I may look at it, at it again as we advance forward over the next few months. I haven't bought any, but it's cool tech. But also next question is, so which layer two are you most bullish on? We have, you know, Optimism, Arbitrum, Metis, Polygon, so many of these roll-ups now. So which one are you like most bullish on or are you bullish on all of them? I would say I'm bullish on the concept of layer twos. I think, I think uh, we're going to have to see how the battle for that plays out. I actually think, you know, Polygon, they get flack because the 
main chain that people think of as polygons is their proof of stake side chain that is arguable. You know, you can say it's a layer two, but it's it's in terms of technology more. They call it a side chain. Uh, but Polygon has incredible business development. I mean, they've signed partnerships with Instagram, with Stripe, with Disney. I mean, those are some of the biggest names in the world, let alone in the world of crypto. And so, so I think that they've got sort of a leg up in there, but Arbitrum and Optimism, of course, have fast growing ecosystems. Uh, and then I'm also going to be watching what happens with Starkware because a lot of very intelligent traders I know think that Starkware is going to, going to be big. Uh, but overall, I would say I'm bullish on the concept of layer two. So I'm building exposure to all of them right now. Yeah, I, to I literally 100% agree on building positions and all of them. I think that one of the best plays of this month was OP buying up like last month. Mm -hmm. That was, that, that I think OP is like, if Velodrum could continue to bring, you know, billions of dollars like curve kind of, I think that it could really grow the price to maybe like $5, maybe, maybe not in the bear market, but I think that it's going to be around for three to five years. You know, I think that it would be ridiculous to think that it's not. And also, well, my personal stance is I, I still think Ethereum is the best chain, even with, you know, gas fees and everything. Um, I, I still think that it's the only scalable one at the moment. It'll probably take some heat from that, but uh, that's kind of my thoughts on it. Like yeah. And the tough thing with OP is they've got a low float. So they have a lot more coins that are coming into circulation. I think the fully diluted valuation would put it like already in or near the top 10. Uh, but it depends on, of course, how they distribute those and when they're distributed. Also, I guess the other problem is the token doesn't really have, it's a governance token right now. Yeah. Uh, but that, that leads into another question from Twitter uh, from that same person. And that is, which three chain ecosystems do you have the highest conviction on over the next few years? And I would say the question was three, but if it's fewer or more, you could just say, which chains do you have the most conviction on? Um, what do I have the most conviction in? So number one, ETH. I'm convinced that they'll build out from all these damn dog coins and fix the ecosystem and everything. Number two, well, that's also like longevity wise. Like, do I think... Like most conviction, yeah, Ethereum's going to be here. I don't think Ethereum's ever going to be dissolved. I think Ethereum DeFi is going to be a leader for the next, however long DeFi exists. Number two, I'm obviously biased, but AVAX, that's one of my favorite coins. I've been doing, I cover AVAX on my Twitter a lot. Uh, I was at a house at AVAX like two weeks ago. I got to talk to the Avalanche team. I can tell the institutions are coming in. There's a lot of real money and real uh, you know, use case for subnets from Avalanche. And I think that's going to drive adoption. Number three is kind of hard. Like, you know, for DeFi, which one do I think is probably going to be have the most conviction in? It's probably a layer two. Like I would probably say Arbitrum or Optimism. But like, I, I really don't see like, Co like Cosmos and Atom. That's probably a close one. But um, I'm not as involved in those ecosystems as I would. But like the, I like actually, so to take back on that answer, less DeFi, this is kind of a smaller DeFi, but XDC DeFi, I have a lot of conviction. Like they literally just announced today that wrap Bitcoin just got ISO compliant. It, when you wrap Bitcoin and use it on the WAN bridge on XDC, it will become ISO compliant and you can use XDC for fees on Bitcoin. And then they have Trada Finance, which is, you know, it's almost like, a traded security on XDC. Interesting. I'm not familiar with XDC. So is that its own chain or is that an interoperability yeah, it, protocol? What is that? Zinfin is its own, you know, it's its own blockchain, XDC proof of stake, XDC is the token. They even have XDC, like kind of like a MetaMask XDC wallet. They have, it's basically like, um, uh, it's an ISO compliant token. So, you know, the goal is for it to be, for peer to peer peer payments, but there's a lot of stuff that's built on top of it. You know, they're trying to build the tokenized stock market on it right now. Um, like I said, Trada, which just got released, is basically like the tokenized assets on that that could be traded on XCC for little to no fees. And um basically, yeah, it's just trying to be DeFi as well. But Zinfin cool. is the thing and XDC is the ticker. That's interesting. Interesting. Um, yeah, as far as which ones. I have the most conviction and I guess I'm just looking at sort of where there's development happening right now. I've been tracking sort of a battle for scalability of the blockchain world. 
and three that they actually they had very similar TVLs as of about a month ago. Cosmos has fallen a bit behind were layer two rollups, polka dot, polka dot parachains, and cosmos all had comparable, comparable TVL. And a lot of people actually uh don't realize this about polka dot because for a long time it was they hadn't had their their auctions yet and they didn't actually have applications built on it. Polka dot actually has about 70 applications built on it now. And if you look at it as if you combine the parachain TVL, it would be the eighth largest chain. So uh, so there's actually quite a bit of development happening there. So for me, I would say Ethereum with the roll-up vision. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I've never owned Polkadot, I will say, and I, I don't have any positions in Polkadot right now. But, but just looking at the amount of money that's been going into their ecosystem and the growth they've had, I think that that is one that I have conviction in. Cosmos, I'm a big fan of, and their vision of interoperability, I really like. Uh, and, and then, you know, I, I know the question was three, but, you know, got, you got to throw in some others that are act actively doing things. Avalanche, they have been launching their subnets and the possibility to have an institutional compliant subnet, I think is is going to be really big as, as we try to get those sorts of players into the space. And the fact that when a application gets so big, like Corvada, that it's that it's sort of clogging the network, it can spin off into its own subnet easily is also really cool. Uh, and, and I mean, the team just has a history of shipping such great products. The Avalanche Bridge even is probably the best bridge I've used out of all those different bridges. Uh, and I, I know they're working on their wallet now. Uh, so, you know, it's one of those things where you look at the teams that are actively shipping. And to me, the Avalanche team is one of them. Uh, and, and those are probably the ones that I have the most conviction. And there's, of course, smaller ecosystems. Uh, there, there always are. But those are riskier and have higher returns simply because I don't have as much. Uh, it's tougher to have as much conviction now. I think that's very true because, you know, as we've known with Luna, anything could happen. Luna had billions of dollars and it literally collapsed. Like, and do I see any of the chains that, uh, that we talked about that happening to? I think it's possible. I think some of the, it's possible one of the layer twos falls down and we don't need all of you know the layer twos or anything like that but i think it's very low chance compared to anything but i think we could definitely agree on that the like layer two roll-ups avax and and adam ecosystem cosmos ecosystem like uh i i really like those as well so what are your favorite like tokens like give me like five tokens that are like your favorite cryptos my favorite crypto as well well you know i'm a big rotator so it's tough to have things for a uh, long time i would say Here's my favorite ones. Um, this one actually I don't is not one of my major positions right now, but it's one of the ones that I have very strong conviction in and one that I'm tracking and I'll probably be booking some profits into in the near future is XMR, Monero. And the reason I say that, it's, it's an old coin, so it's got the Lindy effect going for it because it's been around for longer than almost any other coin that's still in the top 100. But additionally, it's got a very clear use case because it's it's people don't know Monero similar to Bitcoin's proof of work, but it's completely private and, or anonymous, I suppose, you know, you can argue about the lingo, but, but basically, basically it's untraceable. And that is a clear use case there because there's lots of people in the world who would want to make untraceable transactions. And if you look at the uh, daily transactions on Monero, I like to look at the numbers of things. It had its best day ever within the past month highest number of transactions ever. And that's mostly just from actual use case, people using it either to transfer money or to make payments for various things on the internet. And uh, I don't need to use Monero personally, but it's actually being used as a currency, which most things are not. So that one I like. Uh, GMX, GMX decentralized on, on chain uh, perpetuals. So that's cool because I think that on, well, I know that the leverage trading is one of the biggest businesses in crypto and bringing that on chain is going to bring huge amounts of revenue to whoever can do it. And GMX is already generating quite a bit of revenue. Uh, SNX is one that I like right now. So the other, th other cool thing about GMX is that it's the largest applications on Arbitrum. So it's sort of like a proxy bet on Arbitrum for me, since they don't have their own token. Uh, SNX, which is still the largest application on Optimism, although Velodrome is sort of closing in they have been around for a long time and they've 
they make synthetics and they've sort of reinvented themselves as a way to do low slippage trades between different cryptos because synthetic stocks fell out of favor for my understanding is regulatory reasons. Uh, and you know, that's a team that knows how to build and they've also have already most of their tokens in circulation, which is really important because you don't want to buy one of these things that is going to get diluted uh, out of this world. Uh, so that's one that I like. Uh, and, and then, you know, actually, I, I like Adam. I like Adam as well. I like the Cosmos ecosystem. I think Adam has gotten a bad rap because it didn't have a lot of value accrual, but it has it coming through some upgrades they're making to the network. I think that's a good list. How about yourself? So in no particular order, we have XDC is probably my favorite. XDC... I'll, I'll go over them after I do it. So XDC, Chainlink, Avalanche, Ethereum, and what, we, what do I think is like my favorite crypto right now? It's a DeFi token, but I'm biased. Astro from 100 Day Ventures. It's an Avalanche chain. But um, all right, let's do Quant. Well, I think Quant, we could do Quant. Oh, fan of Quant, so, okay. XDC, I kind of went over a little bit before. Number two, Chainlink CCIP is like, it kind of helps people that are building on Solidity and it's it's revolutionary for smart contracts. And Chainlink's integrated in literally almost everything in crypto. Um, that was one of my first big plays was riding Chainlink from like $4 to $40. And, um, you know, that was able to help me out a lot. So I've always liked to link a lot. And I um, also, uh, one, I trade perpetual contracts. I'm like one of the, not a lot of people trade link uh, price action, but I trade link price action. That's just kind of something that I've gotten used to over the last few years. So that's kind of it. It has an um, amazing use case chain. Like it's probably, if not my number one use case token, like number two. So three, AVAX. Um, been involved in AVAX for a while. Uh, I really love AVAX, DeFi, everything in it. I'm very involved with projects on AVAX, DeFi. Really like the Tomb Forks. Uh, you know, I was involved with a lot of nodes. Um, bless you. And, um, you know, those pro kind of projects were good. But, you know, a AVAX, when I went, I made a, a, a 25 tweet thread about AVAX you guys could check it out on my Twitter at John Cole 23 where I basically go over why I think it's going to be a three digit token again you know there so quant quant is overledger and they have a limited supply token and you know and once you start reading into overledger and how it's going to affect all the different chains and run on it you really start to see things but do you know I I would say I have 75 percent conviction in quant I love it's one of my favorite tokens in good communities there is that question of where will the token have use case? Like that's a big problem with a lot of these big projects that, because sometimes they have over ledger and distributed ledger, but the token doesn't have as much use case. And that's a big problem because then you could get, you know, dumped on. And then obviously Ethereum. I mean, I think that Ethereum is going to be the biggest driver for crypto. Uh, I think that the, after the merge it should, you know, I think few understand that if, Ethereum was to flip Bitcoin, it would be during a bear market, right? So I think if that opportunity comes and I think that it'll grow, I think that Ethereum is more than dog coins. I think that there will be more utility added, obviously. I mean, they uh, Vitalik's already said about the roadmap down, down the line. But also, I will say, make it a limited holding because you never know. He, he, he publicly said that he sold and shorted basically Ethereum at 4,800 the other day. It came out where he said, yeah, I sold, I, I, it was a lot of money. Like, and it was to double the runway of the Ethereum Foundation. I'm not investing in Ethereum to do the runway of the Ethereum Foundation. I don't care about that. We want money. So that's my thing about that. So my well, favorite- Yeah, the Ethereum Foundation is a very good history of trading uh, as far as selling near the top, um, which in retrospect is was intelligent for them to do, right? They're, yeah. they're in it for the long run. Absolutely. And, but I'm an investor. So I see it as the Ethereum foundation, but as an investor, it's like, yeah, that doesn't make me too happy. But do I think Ethereum has room to run? Absolutely. And I, I would rather buy Ethereum than Bitcoin. I sold all my Bitcoin at like 30, 32 K, but like, I have a lot of conviction in Vitalik and probably, he's probably like one of my most inspirational people, him or CZ from Binance. I, I like that. 
And um, also, I think we should mention real quick, I, I really like Binance. I think that Binance and BNB is going to be around for a long time. BSC is one of the better, it, although there's a lot of crappy projects on BSC, it runs all the time, super cheap. I mean, there's great volume and it just never shuts down. And I think that I think that BSC will accelerate adoption for most of the world with DeFi. I want to put that in because I do really like uh, what Binance is doing. One of the things I want to talk about is like, where do you see the future of DeFi going right now? It's kind of, everyone's predicting, you know, everyone's either, oh, we're in a bull market again, or is Bitcoin's going to zero. So where's like your, you know, general thoughts on this? Yeah, one of the theses that I've sort of had running for a while with DeFi is that we're probably going to see some sort of bifurcation between the professional and the fun. And so by that, I mean, there's projects that are, the main appeal is that you can make a lot of money or that they're fun to use. And, you know, some of these are games, some of them are just more straight DeFi projects. Uh, and, th and that's honestly a perfectly valid use case for a new technology. There's a famous venture capitalist, I'm forgetting his name right now, but he's one of the big ones on old Silicon Valley. And he says that new technologies look like a toy when they start. They look like a toy. And so you saw that with mobile applications where you had games like Angry Birds and then the real killer applications like Uber came later. You know, they came popular after the games. So crypto, I think, is in that phase where a lot of things look like toys right now. But I think you're going to be see a bifurcation between projects like that and projects that are more serious. And for a more serious one, I might say GMX or SNX, which I mentioned earlier, where they have professional user interfaces, someone who was an experienced trader, a traditional finance person might feel comfortable or at home looking at them or using them. Uh, but the, the value proposition is not necessarily fun, even though some people might consider trading to be fun. They don't have cartoon animals on on their homepage. Uh, I think that some of these projects that try to do both, I think some of those might struggle until they find their place. Because it's tough to say that you're complex serious trading platform and then also have a cartoon mascot because to me those are the the audience that appeals to exists but it's more narrow and if you want to expand outside of crypto twitter then you need to appeal to some to different types of people so i, I see that happening i do see more and more things moving on chain if you look at the swap volume right now less than two percent of swap volume happens on chain I see that growing significantly into double digits at some point over the next few years. And I see the same thing happening with leverage trading. That's with layer two is another scaling solutions. Increasingly, it's possible to actually bring those activities on chain. And I think with some of the issues we've seen with centralized platforms like Celsius, Voyager, people will increasingly want that sort of thing. And, uh, and along those lines, I see a lot of Forex growing in DeFi as well. That's such a killer use case. Uh, I, I don't have a ton of experience with traveling, but people who do, I know we'll talk about the Forex fees when you're withdrawing money in another country. Um, a lot of people say that in certain countries that have currency controls, USDT on Tron is actually the easiest way to get dollars and move them out of the country or move them into the country. So so I see, I see use cases like that being huge. And just for a scale of, of the volume, yesterday, one of the largest decentralized exchanges with something called DFX, which is for Forex trading. And it was the second or third largest exchange by swap volume yesterday. And it was entirely swaps between the dollar and the Turkish lira between stable coins tied to both of them. And so that's just one currency. Imagine once you have all of these different currencies available as on-chain stable coins and people trading between them. I mean, the Forex market does trillions of dollars in volume a day. Uh, so I, I see that being a major, major vertical for whoever can capture that in DeFi. That's pretty interesting. I actually had no idea about that. Uh, the the for, I never really thought, I usually don't think about the Forex uh, side of things. That's really interesting. I did not know that about the US dollar and the Turkish lira. Yeah, well, but, uh, it's, sort of, it's like an evolution of stable coins, right? Because you say curve is people swap between USDC and USDT or other stable coins. But there's also people who want to swap between euro stable coins and dollars or between dollars and lira or dollars and yen. Uh, mm -hmm. And for certain countries, I've heard, for example, uh, certain South American countries where it's tough to transfer money out, USDT is the easiest way. Yeah. Allegedly. That's secondhand. Yeah. And I mean, for me, like 
dudes, I think stable coins are going to accelerate adoption. For me, like when I donate to uh, Save the Children Foundation, they're in Venezuela. How the hell would I be able to send US dollar to Venezuela? You can't. So sending crypto is like easier. That's why I think, you know, it's an amazing use case. But um, yeah, um, for me, I think I see, I, I want to look at it like market cap wise. Like I think DeFi will have five to six million trillion, five to six trillion dollar market cap within two to three years. And I see a lot of the projects doing four to five X from now. I think that in retrospect, we'll see this as maybe the bottom if the macro gets better, but like, who knows? I'm just speculating, right? But like, you know, I think the biggest DeFi use cases and crypto use cases are stable coins. I think everyone's going to be on that wave or built to, built upon the overledger stable coins with no fees. I, I think that's revolutionary. And just tokenization of assets, like you're saying, real estate, stocks, precious metals, everything could be traded as tokenized things. It's just going to be interesting to see what platform is going to be the one that brings that on. And all these use cases are great. You know, for me, like I'm in the, you know, legal NFT side of things, right? There's so many different, there's literally almost a use case for Web3 or DeFi with almost a lot of different things. It's not, maybe Web3, maybe not DeFi, it's like uh, Apple quote about everything, but like Web3 based DeFi is almost like Apple quote to a lot of different problems that I think are continuously going to be solved. Yeah, I think the ownership and financialization of digital assets is going to have a lot of use cases that, you know, we're only scratching the surface of right now. And in and, and one way I, I like to describe it, I mentioned the toy thing before, but imagine if you could go back in time to 1997 or 1998, and you were trying to convince a business owner why he should set up a website. And think about how challenging that would be. Because you're like, oh, you know, there's people, people can see it. And you'd be like, well, people can see it through the yellow pages too. Like, why do why do I care about this relatively small segment of society that's going to find it through the internet? And same thing now, if you were trying to convince a business owner to create an NFT, imagine, say, oh, you know, there's people who use NFTs that will see your business. And you'd say, okay, who cares? That's a small portion of society. But as Web3 wallets become ubiquitous and, and there's things that you can do through them that you can't do normally, like you could easily have in some sort of automated uh, giveaway program, refunds, uh, returning customer cards, loyalty cards, all sorts of cool things, all from the wallet, then suddenly it will start to make more sense. You don't get to a point where everyone wants to have an NFT for their business, or everybody wants to have tokens integrated with their business. Uh, and, and we'll hit that tipping point eventually. Uh, but right now we're in the phase where it's still a novelty like the internet was in the 90s. I think that's really good comparison. I never thought about. I really like that toy comparison, oh, the website uh, to the business owner comparison. I think that's, I think that's a really great perspective. But um, so one of the other questions, I guess one of the final questions I have is kind of, what are your plans? For how how do you plan to provide value in the future for some of your followers and stuff? like moving forward, because I know you're a DeFi content creator. And I'm sure most of my audience is interested in that as well, as well as yours. Good question. So my hope is to just, well, first off, always stay honest and authentic. That's what I've tried to do so far. And I am grateful to have a clear conscience with everything that's happened. So um, my goal is to keep providing my honest assessment of the market, teaching people how to use different DeFi strategies, whichever way makes the most sense, whether that's YouTube, Twitter, right now I'm doing both, uh, or other types of content offerings. Eventually, I'd love to get involved in creating some sort of DeFi service myself, uh, although the right opportunity to do that has not come along yet. Awesome. Well, I'm definitely going to subscribe to that whenever that is. How about so, you? What, what are your plans for the future? How are, how are you going to get your piece of that $5 trillion market cap? So my biggest thing right now is, you know, I still trade DeFi on the side, but, you know, I've kind of have put that down for LLC crypto more. I plan to build LLC crypto to be the legal zoom of the crypto space and provide value through that, uh, either setting up businesses for people, doing one-on-ones with CPAs, helping people get educated on how to use their LLCs and how basically how to help people in the crypto space correctly save money while paying their taxes so they could have more money to invest in altcoins and help build wealth. So just, I just generally want to help people and give my honest opinion about coins and still 
I love doing DJM plays and investing and being a part of the space. So that's kind of my big thing. Amazing. Final thoughts on current and future state of DeFi, John. Current state of DeFi? <laughs> Not looking so hot right now, guys. Well, now we're bouncing back a little bit. I think it's a little bit of a rally and we're going to, we're seeing volume uh, shift between chains and into different, uh, you know, uh, layer twos or anything in DeFi. So I think that's really interesting. And I think innovation is really taking place right now. I think I know a lot of people that are building right now. And I think a lot of the bad characters and bad actors and over leverage got wiped out. So I think it's actually a healthier DeFi market state than we were in the bull run just because of that. Now now we're not over leveraged up and it's like a, a firework ready to blow up. You know what I'm saying? future state of DeFi, I think that's really hard to say just like even today. I mean, we're, there's threats of war, you know, uh, friggin' they changed the word of recession, but we're obviously in a recession, but like, you know, there's so it's literally almost impossible to predict if all goes well, best case scenario, I see five, six trillion. A lot of the coins, like uh, I tweeted at John cool, 23 today, 15 coins that I own that I think will five to 10 X. I think that it's safe to dollar cost average into coins during this time i think we have all about two to three years before we start seeing next you know everything flying up 90 100 in a day everything again i think there is a lot of factors i had a thought last night i was thinking about why bitcoin went to six like 69k right i i think that a lot of those factors need to replay in order for DeFi to get bigger but i think DeFi will be bigger than it was last time and be, reach more people now. And I think that Web3 use case is just going to keep increasing. I mean, every single person that learns about Web3 falls in love with Web3 or understands the use case immediately. It's not a it's not a reason that we're not in this industry for a mistake. It's This is like the place to be is Web3, DeFi, you know, everything. So that's I'm, I'm very bullish on the future. Just like you know, I'm bearish on the world, but bullish on crypto and DeFi in the future, like I think a lot of us are. So, yeah, so I guess that's kind of my final thoughts on it. And without yet, yeah, let me hear what you have to say, too. About it. Yeah, well, first, love to hear it. Bullish on, on the future of DeFi. Uh, one take I have on it right now is that you hear about people who were farming SNX, synthetics, when it was a few cents, and then it went up to being a top 100 coin. Those sorts of opportunities exist in bear markets. And so I don't know specifically what coins those are. I'm doing my best to try to find some of them and start farming them and start accumulating them. But you find those opportunities in bear markets, not in bull markets when anything that launches pumps 10, 100x in one day. So this is the time for people who are interested in crypto to be experimenting on chain. I mean, heck, there are people who made a huge windfall simply because they were using Uniswap before I had a token. So this is the time to be experimenting trying out new things in crypto, being ahead of the curve. Um, there's people who own CryptoPunks simply because it was a cool thing to do and they cost a few hundred dollars at some point. And then they ended up making a killing on those. Uh, and and that, that happened because they were active and plugged in in the bear market. So if you like crypto, now is a better time to be in than it was in the bull market, even if it doesn't feel like it. And I think it's here to say, I think it'll be trillions, if not tens of trillions of dollars in market cap in the future. And I want to make sure that I'm able to claim my stake in that well i think that's very good i i like that a lot too i like that awesome a lot. and uh for people who are watching on my channel what's the best way for them to track your work john um you guys can follow me at john cole 23 on twitter i'm very active on there and also on youtube john cole i cover various DeFi topics some of the smaller stuff and um, I'm also on Discord, which you can find in my link tree. It's all on my Twitter, the Free Passive Income and Research Group. And if you're interested in creating an LLC for your crypto portfolio, or starting a new crypto business, following your dreams, going full-time crypto, you can check out llccrypto.net to get started. Awesome. And uh, for me, what for my guys, uh, what do you got? What's your best uh, contact stuff? Yeah, so my top content platform is YouTube, youtube.com slash Dynamo DeFi. And my Twitter is dynamo underscore Patrick. And I'll have links to both on both of those platforms. And that's where I produce my content. All right. Well, I think that, uh, I think this was a great conversation. And it was really great to hear, you know, someone else's story that's like authentic and really talk, make a great, you know, conversation about DeFi. I really like doing these kind of talks. So I appreciate, uh, you know, the, doing the collaboration and, you know, 
being friends and doing all the going through the ropes together, my friend. Awesome. Great talking to you, John.